Hi everyone, welcome to our latest State of the Consumer webinar. This month we're taking a look at Wellness Reimagined. For anyone out there who I have not yet met, I'm Katie Gross, Chief Customer Officer here at Suzy, and I'm going to kick off today's webinar by presenting both consumer stats and brand examples of what we're seeing in the wellness industry. After a brief presentation, I'll bring our expert panelists, Catherine Chow, Vice President of Strategy and Evaluation at the Ad Council, and Jessica Rosenthal, Associate Director at Church and Dwight. They're going to come on stage and share their wisdom in the wellness space with us. First, who is Suzy? Well, we are an end-to-end -end consumer insights platform that combines quant, qual, and high-quality audiences into a single connected research cloud to help companies grow through customer obsession. And for the first part of today's webinar, we're going to take you through a series of surveys that we ran on Suzy between November 2023 and January 2024 to a sample size of 1,000 consumers. And that sample, of course, was weighted across age, gender, ethnicity, and region. So why wellness? Well, the term wellness is everywhere, and we literally mean everywhere, from the latest trends to the fading trends, to think pieces about what the wellness category even is, the term is inescapable. Major retailers like Target and Amazon have dedicated wellness sections on their websites. And every day, a new news article pops up to talk about the latest in wellness. And this is no surprise, since the wellness industry is projected to grow and continue to grow. By 2027, the global wellness industry is expected to reach $8.5 trillion. And that's a 57% increase from revenue from where we are today. And it's important to understand that wellness doesn't just solve for one consumer need state. When we look at wellness, we think beyond just physical health. We're also looking at wellness in food and beverage, body positivity, financial literacy and wellness, digital health, and much more. Wellness really is a lifestyle. So how can brands meet consumers where they are in their wellness journeys? And that's what we're going to help you solve for today. I'm going to do so by looking at three key areas of wellness. We're going to start out with the trends and explore the latest that's happening in the wellness sector. And next up, we're going to take a deeper look into self-care and unpack what self-care really means to consumers in 2024. And finally, we're going to look at body positivity and uncover how the movement has changed in the age of Ozempic. So first of all, let's dig into the trends. Our insight for this section is that wellness really is holistic. Consumers are looking for more connection across wellness initiatives, and they are willing to pay more to address their needs. And we're seeing this in the data. 70% of our survey respondents said they are willing to pay a premium for products that address both of their needs and align with their values. So the natural next question is, what are those values? A big values-based trend that we're continuing to see and that's continuing to have momentum with is wellness at home. And the trend of wellness at home first started to rise in 2020 when we were all stuck at home <laughs> during the height of the pandemic. It is, however, a trend that's not only stuck around post-COVID, it's also continued to gain momentum. In fact, a whopping 84% of consumers are prioritizing their wellness and their home wellness routines. And they're doing so through a wide variety of means. Sleep came in at number one, the number one way the consumers are prioritizing their wellness at home. And I should know, I actually just purchased a brand new mattress and have slept incredibly well ever since. And 72% of consumers ranking sleep as a priority. The other top wellness drivers include relaxation at 65%, nutrition of 59%, mm -hmm. mental health of 58%, and fitness of 48%. Consumers have plenty to choose from when it comes to brands. They are showing love while working on their wellness at home, from home gym fitness equipment, to ordering DTC supplements and meal delivery kits, to at-home medical treatments and spa experiences, customers have more opportunities to prioritize their wellness at home. And one brand that's leaned into meeting consumers where they're at is Tonal. They offer all-in-one home gyms and customized workout plans. 
And the best thing for anyone who lives in New York City or another small uh, apartment is that their equipment takes up minimal space, making it perfect for those who are living in those cities. Another company that's really leaning into wellness at home is Hims and Hers. They offer personalized D2C products that solve for many consumer wellness needs, including prescriptions for anxiety and depression, daily supp supplements, sexual health products, weight management, hair loss management, and much more. And we can expect to see more brands like Hims and Hers and Tonal pop up as we continue to see the numbers rise on products that support the wellness at home ethos. Our next trend centers around wearable technology. Consumers are looking for a more immersive brand experience with their wearable tech. And 78% of the consumers we surveyed said that they want to see wearables integrated into other tech products. I can imagine a wrist full of products <laughs> not being ideal. As you can see, this industry is projected to have continued growth across all wearable categories over the next few years. From watches to eyewear, to footwear, to neckwear, and more, we're going to be all in on wearables in the coming years. Watches are currently the top wearable, but we're hearing more and more that other wearable options proving their popularity, like the Samsung Galaxy Ring, the Ray-Ban Stories, and Apple Vision Pro. We would love to watch out, no pun intended, for some of these rising wearables and the technology that develops over the next few years. So how often are consumers using their wearable devices? 36% are using them daily, 24% a few times a day when they're most active, and 22% are using them multiple times a day. 71% of consumers are interested in wearables that offer immersive experiences as well. Things like virtual meditation sessions and augmented reality workouts. And this trend of integrated technology goes beyond just the world of wearables. This trend is critical across other aspects of their wellness journey too. Case in point, Peloton. After a huge pandemic boom, Peloton hasn't had the easiest journey since. We've all been able to get back outside of our houses. However, a recent partnership with TikTok offering classes led to a 15% surge. And our next trend is some ways the antithesis of what we're seeing with the wearables tech. And that's a desire to log off entirely, live mindfully and prioritize quality in our lives and the products that we consume. So the trend, slow living, has 1.4 billion views on TikTok and hundreds of thousands of posts of people sharing um, the slow living inspo. There's even an ongoing trend of people showing off their quiet, oftentimes country living lives in an idyllic manner meant to make any city dweller jealous, myself included with my coastal life posters back here. I can only imagine what you're thinking right now. Log off? <laughs> How do we reach our target audience? What about my business goals? Well, embracing a slow living lifestyle doesn't mean that consumers want to completely turn their backs on brands, but instead are looking for brands that support them when it's time to slow down. 87% of consumers said that they're influenced by brands that are committed to a slow living lifestyle. From a tech standpoint, we're talking about products that can go into grayscale mode and make tech much easier on our eyes. Or ones that include screen time or downtime monitors that suggest when it's time to take a break. And slow living goes beyond technology. Who here hasn't dreamed of moving to the country or going off the grid? In fashion, we're seeing more of a rejection of fast fashion and embrace of slow living, sustainable fashion. Same thing with home decor, where people are creating intentional, thoughtfully curated and sustainable interiors for their homes. As consumers look for ways to be more intentional with their consumption, they want to know that the brands that they're choosing, engage and engaging with are supporting their journey. And our last trend in this section is to make wellness personal, which in many ways is an amalgamation of all the trends we've already shared today. We've been seeing more and more brands offer personalized wellness to their core consumers. And one such company is Care Of. You just need to take a quiz on their website 
and they will create a monthly personalized vitamin uh, delivery that meets your specific needs. And along similar lines, we have pros. They offer custom hair and skincare products based on the results of online surveys. And 97% of people who currently use wellness apps are looking for personalized wellness app routines. It's a huge number. The one example of a company that's offering very personal wellness routines is Aptive. They offer access to a wide ranging gym network, personalized fitness routines and mental wellness um, solutions to all of their subscribers. 54% of consumers are looking for affordable wellness bundles from brands. Since wellness is applicable across industries, this can be anything from a clothing brand partnered with a fitness app, on gear and workouts, to something more outside the box, like a financial services company partnering with a nutrition app to help consumers make healthier food choices that still remain within their budgets. So what? What does this all mean? Wellness trends are moving fast, and we're going to continue to see a rise in technology in that wellness space. Brands may want to consider further cross-industry partnerships to really set them apart in the world of wellness. And this brings us to section two. What does self-care mean to consumers? In this section, we're going to understand what tactics people are using for self-care and how brands can help them in this part of their wellness journey. Our insight here is that wellness at home is becoming a bigger priority. So has the importance, therefore, of self-care. 86% of consumers believe that engaging in self-care has a significant impact on their overall wellness. For brands, it's easy to think that self-care is a commercial opportunity. I'm sure we've all taken to the internet to try and find the latest skincare products for ourselves or for a friend's birthday. While self-care -gift, self gifts are still relevant, surface level self-care is not what's most important to consumers these days. For consumers, self-care is about basic mental and physical health management. Our survey respondents are looking to take more time to rest and recharge. So when we asked them what self-care meant to them, responses included things like taking time away to relax and pamper myself, or activities that help me and my mental health in the future. It could just be taking out some time to tidy my apartment, a nice bath, a fun date with a partner, and often just doing what makes me feel good about myself. And for me personally, that's watching Love is Blind. <laughs> so what does that look like? Similar to our wellness at home trend, 76% of consumers are looking for adequate sleep. Breaking this down further, 49% want a consistent sleep routine and 43% want breaks from work and other responsibi responsibilities. 67% of consumers are incorporating regular exercise in their routines with 63% going on daily walks and 36% of us are hitting the gym. And 61% of consumers are using hobbies as a self-care technique. Of our hobby seekers, 61% are binge watching movies and TV. <laughs> so again, coming back, I'm not the only one watching Love is Blind. 58% are listening to music and podcasts and 57% are spending quality time with their loved ones. Consumers are continuously adding to their self-care routines also. We asked wellness conscious consumers what types of activities that they've been incorporating into their daily routines over the past six months. So of those wellness conscious consumers, 69% are doing it through exercise or yoga, 67% through supplements or vitamins, 50% via new skincare products and routines, and 35% through mindfulness and meditation. Even though we'd all love to be able to take up yoga and take a few more naps during the day, that's not always realistic for us. And consumers reported barriers to engaging in self-care are a lack of time at 42%, a lack of motivation at 36%, and family responsibilities also at 36%. So we would be remiss uh, to talk about self-care without discussing its impact on mental health. Talking about mental health used to be a taboo subject, but long gone are the days of putting yourself last. For some time now, when we thought about the idea of self-care in relation to wellness, we thought of this through a very superficial lens. 
skincare, beauty, little treats. These were the things that we tended to associate with self-care. And while those things are still really important as they ever were, prioritizing mental health is now being treated as a critical piece of our self-care journeys. Consumers are looking for simplified access to mental health services. 84% are more likely to use therapy apps that integrate to their existing technology. Let's say you wake up with a headache, can you use your technology to recommend the right breakfast for you? Offer up a custom workout routine and schedule a 15 minute guided meditation session for you that day. While we're seeing a rise in both prescription medications for mental health and therapy goers, the biggest evolution we've seen in the recent years is people's willingness to talk about their mental health journeys. Instead of sneaking into a therapy session, more and more people are being open to the outlets that they are using. Um, sorry, more and more people are being open to the outlets they are using to help them with their mental wellness and discussing it with each other. One company is offering a new take on mental wellness is Bloom. They offer self-guided, personalized therapy sessions for their users. So what's our so what here? Consumers are sticking with self-care basics, sleep, exercise, and hygiene and skincare um, are what they're prioritizing. But this opens up space for brands to update their messaging and to authentically develop products to help consumers sleep, relax, and socialize with new hobbies. So this brings us to our final section before the panelists jump on, body positivity, specifically, body positivity in the age of Ozempic. And our insight in this section is that despite what you may have heard, the body positivity movement is still as relevant as it ever was. Yes, there's been a lot of headlines about Ozempic, of course. We just wrapped up award season with Sunday's Oscars broadcasts. And we've seen a lot of Ozempic ads right there on the red carpet all season long. This leads us to asking a really important question. Has the age of Ozempic killed the body positivity movement? Well, no. Despite the headlines, most consumers still aren't even familiar with Ozempic or what it does yet. Only 35% of consumers reported to being familiar with semaglutides, AKA the medical name for drugs like Ozempic. We're still seeing a shortage of these drugs as well. So most Americans don't and won't have access for potentially years to come. And with the speed that we all move these days, who even knows um, if people will be able to access these by the time they're widely available. Since most people aren't taking Ozempic, how are they feeling about the body positivity movement? Well, 61% of consumers said it's important for them to see diverse body types in advertisements and marketing campaigns. And still 55% do feel that their body type is currently represented in fashion and apparel advertising. But that means that 45% don't feel this way. About half of consumers feel the body positivity ads are very authentic, which means there's been some work um, that's been done already here. And 42% of consumers have felt pressure by social standards of body image. Which brands are doing body positivity well? One example is Athleta or Athleta. There, the Power of She campaign used consumer insights something we love to see here at Susie, to authentically tap into their consumer base. What they found is that women didn't need the brand to empower them in their ads. They felt powerful all on their own. What they needed was just to feel a sense of belonging from that brand. And Nike and Dove also recently partnered together to launch Body Confident Sport, a first of its kind, scientifically proven set of coaching tools to coach 11 to 17 year old girls that will help build their body confidence and make them feel like sport is a place where they belong. So what's our final so what? Despite Ozempic dominating the headlines, and of course Ozempic has had many positive impacts, most consumers still aren't necessarily aware of the drug or taking it. Brands need to stay the course with body positivity, but it's important not to promote body positivity at the sake of health. Promoting healthy bodies of all sizes is really what is key here. And with that, I'd like to bring on today's extra special guests, Catherine and Jessica, to help us unpack what all this means for brands. And just a reminder, please drop your questions into the chat box on your screen, and we will try and answer as many as we can throughout today. 
Hello, ladies. Hello. Hi. Welcome, welcome. All right, let's first of all um, get to know each other. So if you can introduce yourself to the audience, that would be great. And Catherine, we'll start with you because I'm sure that not many people really know who the Ad Council are or what you guys do. So I'd love for you to share a lot of detail about your role um, and more about the Ad Council. Well, we'd love to share and just thank you so much for having me today. We really appreciate it and excited for this conversation. So I'm Catherine Chow. I'm a Vice President of Strategy and Evaluation at the Ad Council. And so we are a nonprofit that convenes storytellers together. And we really do that around some of the most pressing issues in America. And you'll hear me talk a lot about mental health in our conversation today. But our goal is to educate, unite, and uplift audiences. And so you may not be familiar as much with the Ad Council name, but I would bet that you maybe have heard some of our more iconic campaigns like Smokey Bear and Wildfire Prevention, uh, Love Has No Labels, and Friends Don't Let Friends Drive Drunk. But at the Ad Council, our campaigns are national. And what we do is we encompass advertising and media content, uh, community engagement efforts, trusted messengers, and even employee programs to really ignite change in our country and um, look at some of the narrative reframes that need to happen. So for me at the Ad Council, what I do is I oversee our audience research, our strategic development, and how do we evaluate the impact of our campaigns? It's a lot there. <laughs> oh, that's that's awesome. And Jessica, what about yourself? Hi, I'm Jess Rosenthal. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I am currently the Associate Director of uh, Global New Product Innovation at Church and & Dwight, and that really encompasses um, consumer insights, new formulation development, and um, brand marketing kind of all in one. And for those of you who don't know what Church & Dwight does, we make a plethora of consumer packaged goods products, everything from Arm & Hammer, to Batiste dry shampoo, to Trojans condoms, first response pregnancy tests, oral care such as TheraBreath and Oragel, and Hero Pimple Patches being one of our recent acquisitions. Um, my career has spanned many beauty and personal care categories, including L'Oreal and Lauder and smaller, more entrepreneurial brands. But I have a great passion for creating and optimizing products that ensure these product experiences are answering the consumer insights um, that we often un, uh, mine through Suzy um, through formula and brand marketing. I love that. I was just into Jessica last week. Self care for me last week was that extra 20 minutes in bed and I used dry shampoo instead of the petite dry shampoo instead of washing my hair that morning. <laughs> awesome. All right, so let's get started. How are both of you guys defining the term wellness in And Catherine, we'll start with you. Great. Um, well, I see wellness as sort of a plan of action when it comes to achieving well-being, right? So it's the things that people are doing to feel good about themselves, both mentally and physically, and get to the state where you're really thriving in life. And I think what's interesting that a lot of folks used to really think about, and still to some degree, think of wellness and well-being and even just health overall is related to one's physical health. And I think it's so critical for us to think about how is mental health integrated as part of that, both psychologically, emotionally, and even socially, and how these two things, physical and mental health, are very much connected. So when it comes to wellness, we have to really think uh, through a holistic approach when it comes to caring for both our bodies and our minds. And it's about finding what works for you, right? So there's no one size fits all approach when it comes to wellness, and you just have to try different things to see what's going to speak to you and help you. That's awesome. And Jessica, what about you folks at Church and Dwight? Yeah, I mean, completely agree with Catherine. Um, it has to be encompassing of both physical and emotional wellness. But um, there are so many buzzwords that everybody throws around when it comes to wellness and well-being. But they all ultimately ladder up to this concept of self-acceptance for me and, and my brands. It's really that accepting that we all have our own specific needs and really taking ownership and of those needs without judgment. And I'm cho choosing my words carefully. It's not just about body positivity. That, that's certainly part of it. But wellness now encompasses like a holistic approach of knowing the individual needs without judgment and to be able to maintain those needs, whatever that lifestyle may be. If it's a cocktail at the end of the night, that's your self-care. Uh, mm -hmm. If it's a monster energy drink, great. 
or if it's organic food and taking Mozambique, like it, it's whatever works for you. Yeah, I love that. So what wellness trends are you seeing in your industry? Um, so I believe that wellness is my industry. Like for background, I told you I've worked in color cosmetics and skincare and hair care and personal care. Um, right now I'm focusing on oral care for Church and Dwight, but I was really happy to see in your presentation the verbatims around hygiene. Um, when you shared the breakdown of how consumers prioritize wellness, it was really split between sleep, relaxation, nutrition, mental health, and fitness. But all of that ladders up to uh, ultimately good hygiene, right? So when I think about my Origel brand, like you can't sleep if you have a, a toothache, you can't relax, all of those things are affected. So I also think about another trend of longevity. Um, we now have these incredible medical advancements um, and AI and other wellness tools that really allow us to live longer, but we need to do that with a good quality of life. So retirement now means more options, more pickleball. Um, there's more reactive medicine and food, drug, health. And the trend is really to provide these tools to allow you to optimize your longevity. However, information can be overload. So you don't we have to accept that counter trend of the snail girl and the slow living that you presented because mm -hmm. it's how do I prioritize the information that I need? We provide, we as marketers provide the tools, but um, it's on the consumer to say, or, or the brand to say, here's exactly, you know, what I need to make improve my well being. And the last trend I'll quickly touch on is accessibility. Um, these premium prestige experiences are, are being offered to the masses now. Um, it's more inclusive. So the trend I'm seeing is like a trickling down of these wellness experiences, ingredients to become more accessible to all. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, and so Catherine, also you don't necessarily have an industry, but all industries. <laughs> um, so we'd love to kind of hear more about that kind of shifting attitudes that we've seen. Yeah, and I, I can certainly speak particularly to the mental health side of things and what we're seeing shifting there. You know, Katie, as you mentioned about how much the, during the pandemic, it really opened up a lot of conversations around mental health. And I think what's so interesting is that, you know, at that time, we were all going through this collective trauma together. And in a way, there was this permission of it's OK not to be OK, because, of course, everything's on fire. We're all struggling. And I think what's really interesting about where we are today in this kind of new phase of COVID and a lot of people returning back to whatever sense of normal that is, you know, the permission to not be as okay isn't as strong anymore. And so I think as us for brands, you know, we need to think about how can we continue to push through that positive trends that we started to see around mental health and around wellness and continue to connect people to that support that they need and help them to be more open and receptive. To wellness. I think the other thing, too, is that, you know, we heard this decline around mental health stigma. And while it is so wonderful to see that, I think it's still important to acknowledge that stigma is still very much there and still needs to be tackled. Um, we hear a lot about, you know, mental health in some cases for people are still seen through a little bit more of a kind of reactionary, a more severe lens, right? So some people think about they connect mental health to mental health conditions versus, you know, we all have mental health. We all have to take care of it. And I think there's still this kind of internalized uh, stigma around somebody who needs to um, get support or help or being seen as weak. And I think that that's something that we really have to keep countering and showing, you know, who we all need help sometimes. It's OK. And, um, you know, again, connect them to, to support when they need it. Yeah. And it really is difficult to shift because for many of us who grew up in the 80s and 90s, it was just be a superhero, power through, lunches for losers. That was kind of real <laughs> power to get through. Exactly. Yeah, Absolutely. So what impact do you see in the rise of technology um, that, that you're kind of seeing having on consumers' wellness? Yeah. Over to you. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> we all know we're tracking workouts, periods, blood pressure. There's new medical technologies. Um, you can use these apps to control and manage your well-being. But they do have the potential to be, you have the potential to become overly reliant. And then it starts detracting from your wellness, which Catherine can easily speak to. Um, like how many of us are scrolling for two hours, staying awake at night? Um, so 
yeah, there's this counter trend that we need to kind of address um, of like overload. And there's also this rising counter trend of mistrust, um, like with these technologies that I wanted to just speak to. We all saw the TikTok news yesterday. So um, I think there's a equal weight to both that we need to consider. Yeah. yeah. I 100% agree with Jessica. I think there are so many apps out there that can help improve the quality of our life. And that's really wonderful. But I think it's also hard for consumers to figure out which one is right for you. Right. And so, you know, I think the other thing that I've been seeing is that sometimes I'm not sure what's research backed and evidence based. And maybe that's just it. They are and not as well communicated. But I think it's something for us as brands to figure out, like, how can we provide more of that kind of information to help give um, consumers that knowledge of what choice what, when they're making that decision making process. Right. And to Jessica's point about relying too much on tech. I think it's tech is so important to help us optimize what we're doing and we can't let that detract from us. So I think there's a balance of listening to the cues of your smartphone, right? Or your watch, but also listening to the cues of things around you and what your body is telling you. Yeah. It's so important. I feel like at the beginning of every year, I download a whole bunch of wellness <laughs> apps and suddenly I'm getting notifications all day. Drink more water, stand up, take a break. <laughs> I'm like, whoa, you're talking about exactly. Yeah. So let's talk about social media. Um, what about the impact of social media, the positives and negatives? Um, like, what are you seeing? Yeah, I mean, social media, I see it as a tool, right? And it's all about how are you using it and how it's being, how it is for you. And so we know that there is this immense benefit where it can help us feel more connected to others. It can facilitate learning. And then we see on the negative side, the addiction potential oh. side. Right. But there are studies out there that show it can improve your self-esteem and it can also harm it. So it's all about thinking about how as we as consumers of social media, as well as when we're developing things for social media for consumers, how are people using it and how is it making them feel and how is it making us feel? And I think we just have to be honest about it and what is our intentions and then just continuing to have conversations around navigating that use. Yeah, for sure. I think also for many parents having conversations with their kids about how to navigate it too, it's going to be so important going forward. Jessica, what about yourself? Yeah, I think it's on us as brand leaders to to help with that. I mean, it's for us to crack that code that we haven't cracked yet of what are who are the right influencers, uh, who are the right partnerships, what's the right platform. So I'm not saying I have the answer, but we know that people are spending more than two hours a day replacing this human connection on their phone. So um, we know that uh, the younger that consumer, the more impact it has on their mental health, either positive or negative, like Catherine mentioned. So. I just think um, we can use it as a tool to meet consumers where they are. Um, and as a brand, who, who can begrudge that? <laughs> For sure. Jessica, you have such a wide range of products <laughs> that serve the wellness industry. Can you talk through your wellness marketing strategies when it comes to some of those kind of different consumer brands and share any examples? Sure, I would love to. Um, so I mentioned Church and Dwight is a holistic portfolio from Trojan to Hero Pimple Patches to TheraBreath Mouthwash. Cat litter, Arm and Hammer. We uh, not everyone would consider these wellness products, but but I do. They address con everyday consumer problems with consumer-driven solutions, and they contribute to a holistic well-being, improving some aspect of your life. So, if I tie that to my uh, definition of self-acceptance, um, we aim for ways to help create a sensorial moment to facilitate that acceptance. If that's waking up with bad breath, if that's a toothache, if that's a pimple patch, if it's a reliable condom, like all of that goes to wellness, right? No, Nobody's ever walked away from a broken condom experience being like, I feel well. So <laughs> like, all of that matters. It all goes to wellness to me. Um, so I, as a CPG company, one of the trends I'm seeing is also, like I said, a trickling down of these experiences. They're not just for the people who could afford them anymore. They're really taking premium ingredients and experiences and trying to bring them to everybody. Yeah, absolutely. And so do you, how do you, how do your consumers kind of fit your home care products into their wellness routine? 
Yeah, so we make Arm & Hammer and uh, that means detergents and cat litters and home products are just as important to your wellness routine as beauty and personal care. If you can't find your favorite laundry detergent or your cat litter when you swing by Walmart or Target, you're going to buy from our competitors um, or you're not going to shop at Walmart and Target, none of which helps brands. So um, we need to fit into your lifestyle if that's through brick and mortar uh, Amazon, TikTok, location really matters. Um, and wellness also influences like your product experience. So fragrance, flavor development, um, trends in those categories shift as we all know, and with your mindset. So, um, consumers expectations at all of the various price tiers are shifting and that's a major trend that we need to stay on top of. Absolutely. Especially if we're just spending so much more time at home. I know from my surroundings definitely impact my mental wellness uh, for sure. I know the Sneha asked it in the uh, in the chat. We're coming on to it, Sneha. What about pet products? <laughs> We'd love to hear from you, Jessica. Yes, I mean, a special place in my heart. You might see my dog walking in the background, but... Um, I'm for sure. <laughs> <laughs> so glad you asked this. 97% um, of pet owners see their pets as part of the family. Anybody on this call who has one will relate to that. Um, consumers are willing to invest to gain valuable information about those fur babies. I mean... 54% of cat owners are willing to invest in tools that monitor their pet's health. Not all 55, 54 of those surveyed have a lot of money to devote to this. So it's, we expect more information at any price point. And you're seeing new cat litters at all price points uh, that measure the pH of your cat's urine. Some are app enabled to measure the clumps and the color and the texture. I mean, that's innovation. So. There is innovation in wellness across all categories. It's it's when is it too much innovation is a question I would ask. Like, how far beyond evaluating clumps of cat litter are willing are consumers willing to go? Yep, it is. Every podcast I listen to has that ad for the uh, <laughs> for the pH balancing cat litter for sure. Um, and for your consumers, how are you thinking about that kind of personalized wellness experience? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, we know, we saw the presentation, consumers are looking for personalization. Um, when I look at my categories like mouthwash, for example, I may not be able to offer you a custom mouthwash, but I can certainly make sure that my mouthwashes are fitting into your personal routine. So if that means portability or layering flavors or formats, um, they all contribute to some factor of personalization. And it's not just mouthwash. I could go category by category. It's defining what personalization is appropriate for your category. Yeah, yeah, so important. Um, so when we think about the kind of the latest in self-care, there's been a significant shift towards mental health, uh, as we've been discussing. So how are your companies integrating mental health into the wellness offering? And Jessica, we'll stay with you as a brand owner. Yeah, I mean, in my current CPG role, and probably for all of us, it's really about the acknowledgement of mental health uh, and physical health being so integrated, um, all leading up to this concept of well-being. So even functional products like toothpaste, deodorant, condoms, they all contribute to your confidence. Um, and as marketers, we strive to hit some sort of a create some sort of emotion. If that's a placated feeling, I feel good with this condom um, or a peace of mind. I woke up with fresh breath um, or I can get close. Like all of that goes to overall mental health and therefore well-being. Yeah, it's so true. Catherine, what are you guys seeing? So we at the Ad Council, we are really making sure that mental health is a major pillar of our work. And so we have four campaigns right now that's uh, using unique tailoring and different audiences around mental health. So we have one called Sound It Out, which is for parents of middle schoolers to talk about emotional well-being with their children. CZ Awkward, which is encouraging peer-to-peer -peer conversations around mental health as a way to prevent suicide. Uh, don't wait, reach out, which is our veterans crisis prevention campaign. And then finally, we nearly launched this in the fall, which we're super proud of. It's the adult mental health campaign called Love Your Mind. So a double entendre there. But that one really encourages people to prioritize and take care of their mental health. And I think what's so interesting is that there is distinct messaging of each that really speak to where people are and what is it the information that they want to help them, you know, have better relationships, improve their lives. 
And one of the things that we really see kind of cut across all those campaigns is that we are seeing people really knowing mental health is an important topic, like we talked about, but they really want that deeper understanding of how do I better take care of my mental health? How do I have these conversations about my mental health? So it's less of the why now people get that, but it's more of the how. Yeah, that's awesome. And I love that kind of phrase, like sound it out, because it's just it's just so easy to, to remember as well. And Catherine, tell us a little bit more about like the exact kind of approach you're taking to those mental health campaigns and what you've learned through research. Yeah, so we have done quite a lot of research over the past two years, particularly for our adult mental health campaign. Um, and this is for every campaign, though. Research is a really critical process in using tools like Suzy to understand where are our audience mindsets. And so we like to know where people are, um, but then what is it that we at the Ad Council can really do? Because we're a bit more unique, right? I've talked about, we do more of this kind of mass communications approach. And what we do best is really that narrative change and helping individuals make that attitudinal behavioral shift. And because we saw that stigma still is a major barrier for folks, we decided that for us, we really wanted to be more in that upstream approach, right? Um, so what we do is we do like kind of a threefold approach. One is normalize, two is educate, and then three is connect. So for normalizing, we really look at pushing out that messaging there still about like, it's okay to not be okay. We all struggle, even if we may not have a mental health condition. But the other way that we really try to normalize is showing mental health through a much more positive light, right? So not through that kind of severe negative lens that we talked about, but connecting mental health to people's goals and success, that and success, right? Of what they wanna get out of life. Because not always people make that direct connection. And so when we say things like, you know, when you take care of your mental health, you can better take care of others, you can go farther in life, people really resonate with that, right? And Katie, to your point earlier about what people want out of their self-care routine, what they want, um, what they define as success is not always in that materialistic lens. It's really about feeling good, having good relationships. And then of course, educate, so connecting people to the resources that they're looking for, and then connecting people to culturally relevant resources, because we know there's a lot of systemic barriers, access to care, affordability are all challenges that consumers are going through. Yeah, for sure. And then do you help companies or people kind of connect to the resources as well? We do. So um, we have our website, loveyourmindtoday.org. So if anybody wants to take a look at that, that's our consumer facing website. We did a lot of testing there and we really wanted to be intentional and not use a lot of the clinical jargon that people can sometimes come across when they're Googling support, right? And so it really speaks to a lot of the very real challenges that people are going through in a very friendly way. Um, and if anybody is interested in looking at our creative as well, um, or using some of the assets yourself, we're always welcome to partnerships. Um, please go to adcouncil.org to, to look at that. That's wonderful. LYMtoday.org. Everyone, I'll keep repeating it for sure. <laughs> you kind of mentioned it's, it's definitely about, you know, regulating people's emotions for any of my work colleagues or friends that know me. I'm a really anxious flyer in turbulence. And someone taught me just to breathe and just regulate my own breathing, which in turn definitely like calms my entire kind of physical well-being. It's just so simple um, as well. So what are you thinking about, um, about wellness kind of beyond mental health? Yeah, so I think um, with the Ad Council, we have more than 30 campaigns and they all are very much directed at trying to improve people's quality of life. So it can be campaigns um, around, uh, you know, getting screened for potential health conditions like prediabetes or lung cancer. Um, we have campaigns around gun safety and bias and hate and discrimination. And all these, of course, are so interconnected issues, right? And so um, we focus in on them because they touch public health and they impact the well-being of individuals. So yes, we do focus more on the mental and emotional health of folks, but these other pieces too can really impact that. Yeah. So how do you think brands can meet consumers kind of where they are on their journey today? I love this question because there's so I have so many thoughts, but I think you know we know 
that no, there's no one size fits all messaging, right? And that we have to speak to people at the different stages of where they are. And that's where the consumer insights are so critical. And for us, what I like to think about with our work is how do we open people's aperture, right? And speaking to where they are in terms of their aperture. So some people might have a little bit more of a closed aperture when it comes to mental health. They may not think about it. They may not reflect on it. What And that message that we give to someone with a little bit more of a closed aperture is going to be different from someone who's a little bit farther along in their journey. Mm-hmm. And I think that it's important to acknowledge where people are and speak to the challenges they're facing, right? I think sometimes we get into um, this idea of like showing only the positive and toxic positivity can be a challenge. It can be an issue and just not help, even though there's good intentions behind there. So being mindful and and showing where people are and giving credit where credit is due, right? Some people may not think that their daily walk is is something for their mental health, but you know what? That is very much critical and important. So how do you help consumers feel seen? Because when they do feel seen, that really helps them to be more open and receptive to your messaging. And I think the last point um, is really storytelling. We know how important that is. But finding the right trusted messengers is so critical. And what we found in our mental health work is that people want to see themselves right in that trusted messenger. And they want to hear how what their journey was like. What did they do that was useful for them? And I think on the flip side, you know, there is a lot of importance of using advocates and and having advocates help push out your messaging. But there's some some something really powerful and someone who is kind of unexpected that is pushing out your message. And one of the things that we've seen is particularly stories around um, people who are kind of that stereotypically physically strong, right? That you don't connect to mental health. People really resonated with those kind of stories. So for example, one is Casey Field. He is a, a former and retired rodeo cowboy. So, you know, super strong having to like take on these strong animals. And then he talked about his own struggles with mental health. And that just really connected with people. So think about who are your trusted messengers. Yeah, definitely. I know that Dr. Um, Professor Galloway talked about, and I'm terrible with football names, but was a, a college football player who they lost the game um, and you could see him crying and he ran over to his mom and gave yeah. her a hug. And Professor Galloway was like, that is phenomenal. We all get to see that. Of course he was emotional and he wanted to hug his mom in that moment. It's just the storytelling of that is so powerful. Let's move it over to Ozempic. <laughs> so we're hearing about the drugs like this one um, and the impact it's going to have across industry. So not just in food and beverage, restaurant eating, but also clothing, retail. I know that um, airlines are looking into um, the impact of Ozempic on flight, uh, the weight of flights, etc. So there's a lot of kind of second, third and fourth order um, impact that we're going to see from this, I think, in the future. Um, and we're still very, very early in the journey. So are you tracking the rise of Ozempic in your roles? What does it or what could it maybe mean for the body positivity movement? Um, and Jessica, we'll start with you. Sure. I mean, who doesn't love this topic right now? But um, I'm intrigued by the Goldman article that was uh, recently published that said that these new medications, as well as other advances in medical innovation, specifically AI drug discovery, could raise the U.S. GDP levels by like half a percent. That's really significant. That's not just talking about like one industry. It's, it's not just food and weight related shifts. Um, if you think about obesity affecting 42% of the US population, that affects so many industries like CPG, dining, fashion, lifestyle, labor force. Think of the number of sick days with the, for employers. I mean, we, ha- we don't even know the long-term impacts of these medications, but we know they're expected to triple by 2028. So we certainly can't ignore it. And it's also about accessibility, right? The trend that I spoke about earlier. And if it's going to, if accessibility is going to triple, that means, you know, um, the supply chain is affected. Um, There's also a Walmart consumer study that shows that the use of these medications are literally shifting buying habits. Well, we knew that, right? Your appetite Mm -hmm. is depressed, you're going to buy less food. That makes sense. But it's not it's not as obvious as that. It's it's Walmart acknowledging that receipts are shifting. Um, 
that will ultimately affect what goes on their shelves. We all know Walmart and productivity. So what was previously dedicated to Doritos, shelf space may now going be going towards yogurt and berries, for example. It's just, you know, a bad example, but it's not just food. It's about telehealth, uh, employer benefits, um, the ingredient supply chain. Um, and it's a shift not just for consumers, but manufacturers, brands, retailers as well. Yeah, absolutely. We've already seen the kind of shift in confectionery, particularly amongst chocolate confectionery, of a shift towards premium products that are often smaller. They're not the largest size. So maybe it'll be consumers maybe eating less, but trading up to more premium, smaller smaller um, portion sizes um, as well. Um, <clears throat> all right. So let's not think about what's next <laughs> kind of, and beyond uh, Zempic. Are there any wellness trends that consumers are showing fatigue towards that you believe are kind of on their way out. And Jessica, what are your thoughts around that? And what are you seeing? Yeah, I mean, I think we're seeing a shift away from this like pairing back and simplicity movement oh. um, that we experienced during COVID um, and seeing more premium elevated wellness experiences, premium ingredients that are trickling down to all price points. I mean, consumers, no matter what they spend, they want the accessibility, like we've talked about, uh, to this wider range of benefits. So um, consumers have more information at their fingertips and they expect more out of every dollar that they're spending. Um, and yeah. Yeah. Catherine, thoughts there? Yeah, I, I think plus one to what Jessica is saying and, and kind of this shift towards more personalization. I think the other, again, more mental health side of what I'm seeing kind of happening now, it's not so much of a trend, it's more of where people are in their mental health journey. So I, I hear a lot around um, therapy speak. And, you know, as people are learning more about their mental health, they're learning about different therapies, processes, theories, et cetera, which is all really great and important to understand how are we the way we are? Why do we act the way we do? Um, I think that there is, to some degree for some folks, this higher intellectual intellectualization, right, of emotions and feelings. And it's important to have that logical understanding, but then also that emotional understanding is the other piece that's really key, right, to learning how to better regulate our emotions. You have to go through those emotions. And so I think as it may not be as much of a trend, but again, more where people are in their mental health journey and how do you help people, um, you know, how do we as brands support them through that kind of portion of their journey? Um, and so one of the things that I really hope for is more tools around emotional regulation and helping them um, as they kind of, you know, work on the logical side, but also the emotional side. Yeah, yeah, I love that. Um, so everybody on the call is dying to, to know what are those next big trends in wellness um, that we should all be preparing for? Um, and Jessica, we'll start with you. What's coming? <laughs> no pressure. Um, I think I'm just going to link it back to what we've been talking about, this longevity trend, right? It increased accessibility to these well, these premium wellness tools, Ozempic being one of them. Sorry, that's construction. I, I realized everybody could hear it. Um, so I'll keep it short. Customizable nutrition tools, customizable anything really that links, to, that links to wellness and the ability to really tweak your good or service to be just right for the, cost, the consumer. Yeah. I think that tools and products are going to be more focused around prevention and maintenance. You know, I think that our society in the past has been very reactive when it comes to health and people are being more, they're more aware of that, right? They're more aware of um, the need to address that and also get ahead of things. And I think we're especially seeing this with younger generations like millennials and Gen Zers. You know, I think it's always kind of a little funny when I hear about stories of like teenagers already going and buying anti-aging serums and beauty mm -hmm. projects, right? So people are reflecting on what they need and how do I um, really support my health throughout my aging process and throughout my life cycle. And, um, you know, I think that the other thing is that people, while we do like the sound and we gravitate to things that feel like quick fixes, 
I think there's also this disillusionment that's happening and knowing that yes, wellness takes time. It takes energy. It's a process. It's not just a one-time thing. And so for brands to consider, how are you positioning your products in a way that, that speak to what people want um, and, you know, helps them really solve a lot of the issues that they're going through. Yeah. Yep. Often I'll drink some water that day and be like, is my skin glowing yet? <laughs> it's like, it's just discipline over time. Um, instead of doing something every day that's gonna have a big impact to add up. We only have about five minutes left. So looking for advice for the audience. So what advice could you give to the companies who are looking to innovate in the wellness space and ensure that they are meeting those consumer needs and, and staying ahead of these trends? And Catherine, we'll go back to you. Testing, uh, going to research, Talking to your audience, we know is so important and hearing what they say that they want. But I think what's so important is also knowing that sometimes consumers don't necessarily know what they want. Right. And so for us as brands to think about to hear where people what people are talking about, what they're going through and what their pain points are, and then understanding the science behind how can we help them and then creating those solutions that are evidence based. And because we talked about you know, about people have so many choices right now. How are you able to simplify things for them so that it really integrates within their lifestyle, within their, you know, their daily habits? Um, I think the other thing kind of going back to what I was talking about prevention and maintenance, but how can we encourage folks to, um, and consumers to build habits that stick, right? And continually to, to, to work on things throughout um, their journey. Yeah, for sure. Jessica, over to you for our kind of final thoughts on this. Apologies. Um, yeah, I'll keep it quick. I know we have limited time. Um, I completely agree with Catherine. Consumers don't always know what they want, but that also extends to, thus to retailers too. And it's up to us as brand owners to not only educate on what the consumer needs are, but when it's right for brands to action upon them. Um, and I, I thought that was an important point to make. I've worked in several product categories, mass prestige. And one of my biggest takeaways is knowing when a trend is right for your brand to act on. It's great to be first most of the time, not always. And I, uh, I think that often as I, as I do my job. Yeah, absolutely. I've listened to a lot of podcasts recently about strategy and strategy is as much what you say no to as it is what you say yes to. So completely agree with you there. Fantastic. Catherine, Jessica, this has been absolutely wonderful. Thank you so much for being such amazing guests for the audience. I hope you learned a lot today um, and we will see you on the next State of Consumer webinar. Thanks for everybody. Thanks for having me. Thanks for having us.